Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to um, the next module, module 8. This is lecture 36 and we are going to go through the first part of cell chemistry. So what we are going to do in this uh, lecture and the subsequent one is uh, we will cover some of the basics of cell chemistry. Um, so this is divided into two parts and some of the topics that we are going to cover are chemical bonds that exist in um, inside the cells. So, what are the cells made of? What are the chemical bonds? What are their importance in uh, microbiology? What is the cell composition? And what are the major biological macromolecules? So, these are some of the things we are going to cover in this particular topic. Let's just go through something that you have studied before, but it always helps to go through it at least a few dozen times because uh, these are fundamentals it never hurts repeating them so you know that uh, you're all uh, familiar with ionic bonds and covalent bonds okay so ionic uh, bonds are formed when you have charged species they may be ions they may be compounds and they are formed these ions or compounds will either accept or donate electrons and in the process of donating or accepting electrons they may become positively charged or negatively charged and when you have opposite charges, attraction between these opposite charges will result in ionic bonds. Then we have covalent bonds and covalent bonds are basically sharing of electrons. And let's come to one of the most important uh, concepts in biochemistry or in microbiology. And that is that the major nutrients, we, I call them the big six. So, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur, these are the big six and these six elements comprise the bulk of the uh, mass of any uh, living organism perhaps but more so for microorganisms. So, the sharing of electrons by any of these elements is basically going to result in covalent bonds and the vast majority of biochemical compounds are basically covalently bonded and within covalent bonds you have your saturated uh, covalent bonds which means there is a single uh, sharing of electrons and you have unsaturated share, uh, covalent bonds where you have double and triple bonds so let me just go through a few of these examples so you have ethylene here where you have a double bond between the two carbon atoms and um, you have acetylene which is a triple bonded organic compound so you have a triple uh, bond between the two carbons in carbon dioxide you have carbon associated with two oxygen atoms and both of them both these um, c double uh, co bonds are double bonded nitrogen the two nitrogen atoms are triple bonded and in phosphate you have uh, phosphorus double bonded to one oxygen and single bonded to the, re the remaining three oxygen atoms. In proteins, we have uh, carboxyl groups. Proteins or amino acids are identified by the fact that they have one carboxyl group and one amine group and you can see uh, one of them is a double bond and the rest are all single bonds and in uh, the nitrogenous bases we have a ring structure and then we have phenylalanine is an amino acid which has an aromatic compound or a benzene ring with a large uh, functional group attached to it just to give you an idea about the bond energies and this is very important from a biochemistry perspective so uh, remember that it is the making and breaking of bonds 
that is going to be utilized by the organism for either its catabolic reactions or its anabolic reactions. So, uh, when I say catabolic reactions, it means breaking down the compound to create monomers and new biomass. So, there is, an, there is a release of energy when compounds are broken down. And when new compounds have to be formed, those are anabolic reactions. And that is where the energy is inputted into these new uh, compounds that are formed and that again takes a large amount of bond energy to be formed. So, these bond energies are extremely important for us to understand how much energy is required by the microorganism in either uh, making certain compounds or in breaking them down, what does it get in terms of energy. So, this is a very crucial point. So, you can see the single covalent bonds, you can see the bond energies for the different elements. So, two hydrogen atoms, carbon and hydrogen, carbon and oxygen, carbon and nitrogen. You can see the bond energies both in terms of kilocalories per mole versus kilojoules per mole. In terms of double covalent bonds and triple covalent bonds, similarly for two different elements, whether it's carbon and sulfur, carbon and carbon, carbon and oxygen, two oxygen atoms, all of them have different bond energies and this is what it takes to either get energy or to make these compounds and uh, you need energy inputs. We also have bond energies associated with aromatic rings like benzene. We will come to the other uh, four types of bonds and these bonds despite their weakness, look at the magnitude difference and not just one order of magnitude but two orders of magnitude difference. So, hundreds of times a less bond energy is there in hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals forces. Now, these are extremely weak bonds but their importance in microbiology and, and biochemistry is enormous because the stability of the higher level structures is dependent on these weakest interactions and we will be seeing a lot of that in the subsequent slides. So, I am not saying that the covalent and ionic bonds are not important, they are very important, but the importance of the weak bonds cannot be underestimated because almost all the bioactivity is associated with the presence of these weak bonds. So, that's where we are right now, hydrogen bonds. How is hydrogen bond formed? So, hydrogen is electropositive and it will bond weakly with electronegative elements like oxygen and nitrogen. And some of you may have studied this. You know that water is a biosolvent. You know that it's H2O. So, you have oxygen and you have the two small hydrogen atoms attached to the oxygen. Now, because oxygen is much bigger, it attracts the electrons towards itself, it becomes more electronegative while the hydrogen atoms are more electropositive. So, there is a polarity between, uh, within, not between, it, there is a polarity within a, a water molecule. So, there is one side of the water molecule that is electronegative and the other side where the two hydrogens are is more electropositive. Now, because of this polarity, you will get an orderly arrangement of all water molecules with each other. They form a very ordered and stable structure. So, this stable tetrahedral structure and highly ordered arrangement makes water the unique biosolvent that it is. Without water, there is no life and life began in water and why is water such an important um, media both within and without for the cells. So, it has, a, it has these unique properties mainly because of the hydrogen bonding between adjacent water molecules. So, the anomalous properties of water that we know, we know it has high surface tension, we know that it has high specific heat, we know that it expands when uh, frozen and ice is lighter than liquid, uh, than the liquid form, the solid form is lighter than the liquid form. No other solvent has the same properties. 
and this is what allows life to survive even under sub-zero conditions. So when the ambient temperature is sub-zero, it's that layer of ice that forms literally an insulating blanket that allows life forms to exist below the ice. So all these things is what makes life uh, possible and it's very important. It's all based on this hydrogen bonding. Okay, so that's all about hydrogen bonds. Let's now come to Van der Waals forces. These Van der Waals forces are non-specific. Uh, these are weak attractive forces that exist either between atoms or within uh, between molecules. And uh, this is most uh, apparent when the distance between them is 3 to 4 angstroms. Um, these forces are um, operative when uh, you have enzyme substrate complexes. So the binding of the enzyme to the substrate complex is because of Van der Waals forces. They are important in uh, protein nucleic acid interactions. Um, so these are some of the things that are very important uh, when we think about Van der Waals forces. Then we come to hydrophobic interactions. This is the third one of our weak interactive, uh, weak interaction uh, energies or forces or whatever you want to call them. So we know that like dissolves like and that is based on the polarity of substances. So a polar solute will dissolve in a polar solvent and a non-polar solute will dissolve in a non-polar solvent. Um, now what is important in terms of examples for example is uh, the formation of the plasma membrane. So you have the plasma membrane which is made out of amphipathic molecules or the phospholipids. These phospholipids have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. Now what happens is that when you have a large number of these phospholipids in solution in water, they will automatically arrange themselves in a bilayer. So this bilayer will have heads all facing water and the tails will all face each other. So there is a hydrophobic layer that is sandwiched between hydrophilic heads and uh, this makes in practice this makes the plasma membrane practically impermeable to anything including water so it precludes water it's like having an oil layer in between two water layers so this is a very important uh, reason for looking at hydrophobic interactions and I will be later on talking about uh, the folding of proteins. The tertiary and uh, quaternary structures of proteins also have an important uh, role for hydrophobic interactions. So these are some of the things that matter. Let me also say another one more thing. Weaker bonds like these, so hydrogen bonds, Van der Waals forces, hydrophobic interactions, these are extremely weak as I've shown in this table. And you can see that they are two orders of magnitude weaker than either covalent or ionic bonds. And, um, but, the, but they are the basis of uh, the bioactivity of proteins and so many other biochemical uh, reactions. Let's take a look at hydrogen bonds and how they play a part in the bioactivity of different macromolecules. So we're going to look at proteins and nucleic acids. I'll be showing you some graphics about both of them in the second half of this topic. Uh, but for now, let's just keep in mind that the primary structure of proteins is just a sequence of amino acids. They're all uh, in a particular specific sequence and that sequence is going to determine the nature of the protein. So these are strong, strong bonds, covalent bonds between adjacent amino acids. That primary structure is important, but by itself it has no biological activity. The biological activity of proteins and enzymes comes from the higher level structures. So you have the secondary, tertiary and quaternary structures. So it is the folding of this primary strand that will determine these higher level structures. And we will see, like I said, I will show you graphics that will make it clearer. But there are two types of folding that proteins undergo. So the primary or what we call in the primary structure, we call it a polypeptide strand, polypeptide for the uh, number of amino acids that are uh, part of the 
polypeptide strand. Now these polypeptide strands can either form a helix. So if you can think of a spring, um, a metallic spring, it is a helix structure. So the same kind of thing is formed by proteins. That is one type of structure. The second type of structure is a pleated sheet. So when you fan fold paper, that is a pleated sheet. So these proteins, these polypeptide strands form either helices or they form pleated sheet structures. The spirals of the helix. So if you can imagine your metallic spring, the spirals, each, uh, each circle of that helix is bonded to the adjacent circle by hydrogen bonds. That's how the spacing and the folding is maintained. And similarly, you have multiple polypeptide strands and each of them is, you can imagine that they're fan folded and each of these sheets is stuck together to the adjacent sheet by hydrogen bonds. So if you uh, uh, look into any of the textbooks, you'll find good graphics explaining all of these. It's very important for understanding how these proteins are folded. That is the secondary level. The tertiary level now has a mix of all types of bonds. It has ionic bonds, it has covalent bonds uh, like uh, disulfide bridges, those are covalent bonds. It has hydro, uh, hydrogen bonds, it has hydrophobic interactions. Now remember that many of the amino acids have um, uh, non-polar functional groups. So these non-polar functional groups are hydrophobic and because of their hydrophobic nature you will have Amphi um, amphoteric properties in these uh, molecules and that will also result in certain spatial arrangements. So we'll go into that in the next part of this topic. And then finally we have quaternary structures. Quaternary structures are formed when you have more than one polypeptide strand in a particular protein. So the best example is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is, is something that you have all heard about and it has four polypeptide strands. Each one of these four polypeptide strands is folded in a particular way and they're arranged, arranged spatially in, all, in a particular fashion. Now, there is also a heme group that is associated with each one of these polypeptide strands and that is the active site. But if there is any disturbance to the way the protein is folded, then the bioactivity is going to be compromised. So uh, the entire bioactivity of a protein is associated with uh, any one of these levels of structure, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structures. And in all of them, you will find that the weak interactions, hydrogen bonds, Van der Waals forces, all of them are important. Then we come to nucleic acids. So nucleic acids, you have either DNA or RNA, and we will take a look at both of them in the second half. The DNA is a double-stranded molecule. I'll show you the structure, like I said, in the second half, where complementary nitrogenous bases, adenine, will bond to thymine on the adjacent strand. So you have two strands, adenine on one will bond with thymine on the other, guanine on one will bond with cytosine on the other and these bonds are hydrogen bonds. So they're very weak bonds which allows the double stranded structure to come together or fall apart easily and that is crucial to uh, these bioprocesses because unless the making and breaking of these DNA strands is easy it becomes too energy expensive. So this is how uh, all the processes of reproduction, replication of uh, the, the DNA strands, the RNA, the protein synthesis, all of this is based on weak hydrogen bonds. There's nothing that I can say more about the importance of hydrogen bonds. Um, and then you have, uh, that I've already mentioned all this. So we'll come back to this point again. Let's take a look at the composition of a prokaryotic cell. Now, a prokaryotic cell, we're I think I may have mentioned in some at some point in the past that we are dealing with bacteria. Prokaryotes are bacteria and these bacteria are studied better than any of the other microbial 
groups. So the composition of the prokaryotic cell is what we are interested in over here. And uh, there are two things to keep in mind over here. One is the total weight. So when I say total weight, that includes the weight of the organic compounds, including water. So the total weight of a bacterial cell as a simple approximation we generally say it's one picogram and one picogram is 10 to the power minus 12 grams we also know that by and large the water content of a cell minimum is 70 percent it can go up to 80 or 90 percent then we come to the dry weight now if all the moisture is removed from the cell and you look at what is what is the organic content of the cell in terms of macromolecules? 96% of the dry weight of the cell is these macromolecules and the remaining is monomers and inorganic ions. So the monomers are 3%, the inorganic ions are 1% and the bulk of it is macromolecules or what are called biopolymers or biological polymers. So out of this 96%, proteins are 55%, polysaccharides or carbohydrates are 5%, lipids and fatty acids are 9.1%, lipopolysaccharides, which are lipids and polysaccharides together, that's 3.4%, and the nucleic acids, DNA is 3.1%, RNA is 20.5%. So this is a broad uh, understanding of the composition of a prokaryotic or bacterial cell. The remaining are monomers. So we have polymers. Um, the monomers of proteins are amino acids and their precursors. So you will obviously have some amount of monomers floating around and that is 0.5%. The monomers of carbohydrates or polysaccharides are sugars. That's about 2%. Nucleotides and their precursors are the monomers of DNA and RNA and that's another 0.5%. That's in terms of macromolecules. What about the elemental composition? So from an engineering perspective, it's often very important for us to know the elemental composition of a cell. And uh, this is from another textbook that we use for what wastewater engineering. So this is the typical composition of bacterial cells. So Carbon is about 50% of the dry weight. Oxygen is about 20% of the dry weight. Nitrogen 14%, hydrogen 8%, phosphorus 3%, sulfur, potassium, sodium about 1%. And then we have the other nutrients. So the, these are what we call macronutrients. And then we have the micronutrients, calcium, magnesium, chlorine, iron, and so many other elements that are part of the periodic table they are all below 1% and we call them micronutrients the others above equal and above 1% they are all macronutrients uh, we have seen the biomolecules or the bio macromolecules or biopolymers whatever you want to call them now these biopolymers are made out of monomeric units depending on the nature of the polymer that we are looking at these monomeric units may be a few tens or hundreds of monomers attached together in either uh, non-coding uh, sequences or uh, in particular sequences okay now each of these monomers can be as small as a c1 compound to as much as c30 uh, c30 means containing 30 carbon atoms so you can have very large monomers or you can have very small monomers so these monomers can be c1 compounds all the way to c30 like fatty acid compounds and uh, these monomers will be linked together maybe tens of them or hundreds of them and so on so we'll take a look at all of them now we have four major classes of biological macromolecules like i said there are carbohydrates proteins lipids and nucleic acids so the monomeric form for the polysaccharides or carbohydrates is sugar for the lipids it's fats or fatty acids for the nucleic acids it's nucleotides and for the proteins it's amino acids and we're going to take a look at these details in the next part remember one more thing that out of these four classes of 
biological macromolecules. We have informational macromolecules and non-informational macromolecules, which means that the sequence of the monomeric units is important. That has useful information. So these informational macromolecules are proteins and nucleic acids. We know that DNA is the genetic code. This genetic code will then be given to the RNA and the RNA, there are three types of RNA which I will talk about later. These three types of RNA are uh, required for protein synthesis. The protein sequence of amino acids or rather the sequence of amino acids in proteins is again very essential for their biological activity. So sequence maintenance is crucial to biochemical reactions. Without these sequence maintenance, uh, the bioprocesses will be jeopardized and the organism can die. So uh, sequence maintenance is crucial for the life processes. All biological process information of replication, operation and so on is based on these sequences. Then we come to non-informational macromolecules. So lipids and polysaccharides. Just as we know from our own diet, we know that sugar and fat, they don't provide any information. What are they doing? They are providing mass and energy. Same thing for the microorganisms. Sugar and fat is useful only for providing organic carbon and energy for the organism to survive. So the sequence is repetitive. It has no functional importance. It's a source of mass and energy for the organism. Where are these macromolecules located? What is the location? So the proteins are generally found in the cytoplasm, the cytoplasmic membrane, the cell wall and the flagella. So uh, we have seen a little bit about the cell structure. We are going to focus more on the cell structure in the next topic on cell biology. And uh, when we look at microscopy and cell biology, we will be able to uh, understand how important these are. The nucleic acids are found in the ribosomes and in the nuclear region or the nucleoid uh, and the polysaccharides are found in storage granules and the lipids are distributed in the cytoplasmic membrane as well as in the storage granules. So like I said, let's take a look at some details. We will take a look at each of the monomeric units and how they form polymers and what is the nature of the, those polymers. Um, so let's take a look at the first set of uh, monomers and that is sugar. So it's easy to start with sugar. Uh, there are two sugars that are shown over here. The first one is a pentose and the second one is the glucose okay so let's take a look at where the pentoses are the pentoses are part of rna and dna so ribose is a pentose it has five carbon atoms and you can see them written in open chain form and ring form now those of you who have studied a little bit of organic chemistry you probably know that the ring form dominates in aqueous solution so it's never formed it's never um, available in the open chain form you have very minute amounts that are present in open chain form the bulk of the compound is always present in ring form that is the stable arrangement of the sugars so the ring form is dominant 99.8 percent of the sugars are present in ring form and like I said the pentoses whether it's ribose when it loses its oxygen it's called deoxyribose and this deoxyribose is the sugar that is present in DNA. Then we come to glucose. Glucose is a hexose it means it has six carbon atoms and these six are shown over here in open chain form and in ring form you can see the spatial arrangement. Um, you, you probably know that glucose is, it kind of forms a chair structure. So if it's possible for you to, I don't know if I can show it, yeah, no. So it forms a chair structure. 
this is the structure of a glucose molecule and um, it's not only an energy source but it's also a major component of the cell wall and I'll show you something more about that in the next slide so these OH groups at the C2 position are substituted by other functional groups so I'll just show you that so the cell wall is made out of what we call derivatives of glucose so you have n-acetyl glucosamine and you have n-acetyl muramic acid and these are this is the ring form and at the C2 position the OH group has been replaced by this particular group n n replaces oh of the sugar and you have this attachment so you have the acetyl glucosamine functional group attached to nitrogen so this is one of the building blocks of the cell wall and there is another building block of the cell wall and that is uh, n acetyl muramic acid so in some textbooks you will find this shortened to nag and nam in other textbooks you will find g and m uh, so either way these are the building blocks of the cell wall of the uh, bacterial cell and it does have several significant properties which we will come to in later topics um, so again you have another functional group at the c3 position and uh, this is going to give it different properties and like i said it's all part of the cell wall now uh, when we think about hexoses we have glucose sucrose fructose lactose all these are uh, different types of sugars now out of the hexoses we have glucose and fructose and then you have um, and lactose and uh, sucrose are disaccharides so those are uh, already uh, two monomers attached together so there are all kinds of um, uh, sugars that are present in nature as well as within the cells thank you and i will stop the first part here and we will continue with the second part